I'm going to talk about the noising of Monte Carlo renders. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of image denoising, um, details about our implementation, uh, and finally, maybe some details on my actual work on this algorithm. Um, we'll start with basic question, what is noise and what is a denoiser? Um, noise is basically any kind of random, small, irregular artifact that makes our results different from the ideal ones. Um, we'll be talking about noise in uh, Monte Carlo renders, but noise is something that happens in other situations, for example, uh, photographs, video recordings, audio recordings, even when you talk to somebody in a noisy room, you hear their voice along with all the other random sounds around you. So all of that is noise, and it, it's basically something that makes our result worse than the uh, ideal. Uh, in the, concept, in the uh, context of Monte Carlo renders, noise is, and it's probably not very clear here, but it's the small random fluctuations of pixel uh, intensity and colors that you get uh, usually on Monte Carlo renders. Um, and it makes our image basically worse. And the denoiser is a program that takes such a noisy image like this one and converts it to a much smoother image like this one. And I don't know if you can see a lot of difference. Uh, you can basically see it here in the shadows a little bit. Uh, so if you look at the original render, there's a little bit of noise. and the denoiser basically removes it. Uh, so a denoiser is a program that takes the noise image and gives us a smooth one, while hopefully preserving all the detail and not ruining the image in any way. What causes noise? It's an interesting question, uh, and it mostly happens because we don't actually know what the final result is. If we knew the final value of all pixels, we would just put them there and we'll be done. But uh, we don't do that. We try to guess the final pixel values by using Monte Carlo integration. And it's, it is, by its definition, a guesswork. We try to guess what the final result will be like. And we can make this guess in a number of ways. Uh, for example, we can uh, calculate the value of the function that we're integrating, in this case, the rendering equation. Uh, we can take several samples. And by looking at the values of those samples, we can sort of guess what the final pixel value should be. Um, but we can also use any other information that we can get from the scene. And uh, there is an interesting observation that uh, basically all the improvements, all the advancements in ray tracing have come because of new ways to either use existing information or uh, to collect and use new information about uh, a 3D scene. Uh, some examples of better usage of uh, information is important sampling. We know, for example, that light sources are important in our scene, so we can take special care of sampling them separately from anything else. Um, multiple important sampling goes a step further by using information from several different sampling techniques in order to make the final result uh, better. Adaptive sampling. Uh, tries to collect information at runtime. It doesn't rely on uh, any sort of uh, pre-calculations. Basically, it tries to gather information from the scene itself as the rendering progresses, and then it tries to reuse this information. Um, for example, VRA does adaptive image sampling, where it can figure out which parts of the image need more work and it can focus its efforts there. But it can be done also in many other ways. Um, we can also use information between, uh, you can also share information between separate independent calculations. Um, and examples of these are bidirectional path tracing, um, point-based caching solutions like Radiance caching. Uh, they calculate various values like global illumination at different points in the scene and then try to interpolate for all the other points, basically sharing the information from a few places to uh, all the intermediate points. Um, and also, denoising is uh, an image-based technique for sharing information between uh, pixels in the image. So it's not a 3D approach like irradiance caching. It works 
in image space, but it also can be viewed as a way of sharing information between uh, different calculations. And the key to making a successful algorithm and a successful denoiser is to figure out to what extent we can share this information. If we do it correctly, the results will be very good, uh, like I showed in the first image. If you do it badly, we'll get artifacts uh, like flickering or light leaks or blurry results. Um, so it's important to get it right. Um, and it's also important to realize that, like I said, all of this here is guesswork. If we guess right, then everything is good, but we can't be always right. Uh, so the requirements from our denoiser, basically it has to be reasonably fast uh, and hopefully faster than just rendering the image with higher quality. It should be unnoticeable in the final result. You shouldn't be able to tell that an image has been denoised. Uh, it should preserve all the image details. It should not introduce additional artifacts. Uh, a little bit of history, the noising is, it's become more popular in, in recent years, but it's not anything new. Um, the noising has been around for a really long time. Um, the first time I ever saw the noising being used in the context of image rendering is, there was a paper by Henrik uh, Jensen, where he used a median filter to denoise the, the GI version, uh, the J portion of an image and then blend it with a direct illumination. Um, there are also many denoising uh, tools intended to work with photographs or video streams. Um, video typically works better because we have multiple frames and they provide additional information. And as I try to explain, more information usually results in getting better results. Um, there have been products for uh, image denoising for a very long time, like Neat Image, Red Giant Denoiser, and others. They were originally uh, specifically for video and uh, photograph denoising. Um, ah, this is actually two images from the first Jensen paper. This is the original render. It's not probably very obvious, but it's a little bit noisy in the shadows. And this is the version where the GI render element has been denoised with a median filter. And it definitely looks better. And uh, Jensen did this like, more than 20 years ago. But it took 20 years for the concept to catch on. Right. Uh, I've, I've known people using neat image to denoise their, their renderings for a long time, maybe 10 years or so. So it's, it's not by any, uh, it's not something new. But recently there has been a lot of research in that uh, for several reasons, mostly because ray tracing has become um, the algorithm of choice for producing photorealistic images, and ray tracing is unfortunately on the slow side. Um, it takes a lot of time to get a clean image out, so anything that can help speed up that process uh, is very good. Um, also, renderers can provide additional information about an image. If we have just a photograph or a video stream, that's all we have. But the renderer can give us all kinds of different information. It can provide us with surface normals, z-depth, um, diffuse texture, color, any additional information that we might need to produce a better image. And again, having more information helps us to get better results. Also, several companies demonstrated that uh, you can actually use denoising in uh, feature films. They were a little bit behind the Argus guys who've been using denoising for a long time, but uh, the film Gravity uh, used denoising. Uh, Frame Store is a uh, a uh, UK company that worked on it, and the renderer that they used was a little bit on the slow side, so they used denoising to get better uh, results. Disney released Big Hero 6 last year, and it used their uh, denoising technology quite extensively, and nobody noticed, so that's a good thing. Um, many rendering packages now have denoising tools, and there are also companies that develop standalone tools for denoising uh, Monte Carlo renders. Uh, currently, the only one that I know is a product called Altis by a company called InnoBright. And uh, they can basically take render uh, images from any render and uh, denoise them. So, um, now a few different algorithms for uh, denoising images. They more or less describe the different things that I tried when developing the V-Ray denoiser. 
uh, starting from the few from the basic ones and simple algorithms and then moving on to more complicated ones. Um, the, the simplest form of denoising is just to blur the image. Basically, uh, for uh, every pixel, its final color is a weighted average of the colors of nearby pixels that are in some region R around uh, our pixel. And each of those colors is weighed by some weight function. Um, the weight function uh, for the uh, Gaussian blur is just the exponential function. Uh, let's forget about this term here for a moment and assume that it's not here. So it's basically an exponential function where the exponent is just the distance between the pixels with some scaling coefficient. Um, and it's very, very easy to implement. Uh, and here is basically a demonstration of that. We, I chose a pixel somewhere here from my image. This is the area around it that I uh, take. So I take all these colors, I multiply them by the uh, Gaussian function. Uh, I get this result and then I get the weighted average of all those pixels. And uh, when I do the same thing for all the pixels in the image, I get something like this, which is obviously there is no noise, but it's also very blurry. So it's not a usable image. And the question is, can we improve this result? Uh, yes, we can with a technique called bilateral filtering, which is basically a Gaussian filter, but it also takes into account other, not just the distance between pixels, but other properties as well. Um, we can take the color of the pixels. So if we have a bright patch of pixels next to a dark one, uh, we can prevent the blending between those areas. Uh, we can also look at things like normals and z-depth to figure out uh, whether we can blend between two pixels in the image. Those additional render elements separate from the color of the pixels are called feature elements because they help us determine what is a feature of the image and what is noise. And the feature is something like a shadow edge, which no matter how many samples you put into the image, it's there, it doesn't go away. Whereas noise is something that with uh, more samples usually uh, cleans up. So those additional render elements can help us distinguish between uh, features and noise. And I'm gonna talk about this part a little later. Uh, so yeah, this is pretty much the uh, same as the next slide, but um, in addition to the color and the normals, we're also looking at some other properties of the uh, scene, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment. The formula for the bilateral filter is pretty much the same as that one for the Gaussian. The only difference is how we compute the difference between two pixels, uh, P and Q. And in addition to just the distance between those pixels, we also take uh, the differences in their colors, in their normals, and anything else that we want. Uh, again, with some scaling coefficients here. Uh, we're gonna talk about those a little later. The way this works, uh, for example, here I'm just using the dif distance between the pixels and the difference in colors um, to compute the uh, weight of the colors, and this is the final result here. Uh, it's better than what we had with pure Gaussian blur. For example, the white spot here uh, is sharp, it's not blurred, but other areas of the image are blurred. Um, here I'm just taking into account the distance between the pixels and the difference in normals. I get better results in some areas here, but others are wrong. Uh, finally, in this version, I take the uh, dif distance between the pixels and the difference in the diffuse texture color. And this works fine to preserve the texture detail here in the area of the image that is in focus, but it has other problems. Um, and this is finally I get all those things and combine them and add them together and I get actually a pretty good result which uh, preserves detail uh, and basically, actually this is quite a good image. Um, if that works so well, the only question is how to choose the different scaling parameters that we had in our uh, formula here, how to choose all those different numbers. And one way is to just leave them for the user to figure out. You just put a bunch of parameters and expect the user to find the right values. It works, but it would require like five or six numbers that have no meaning to the user at all. Um, the other option is to make this choice somehow automatic. 
Um, and we would like to choose the parameters in such a way that clean parts of the image are, remain clean while we only remove noise from noisy part of the image. To help us with that, we can request the renderer to actually tell us which part of the image are noisier. Um, how do we do that? Um, first, a few words about uh, something called variance. For uh, all the pixels in our image, we compute a bunch of, of samples uh, that we average together, and we can compute uh, the variance of those pixels, which is basically the sum of the square difference between the color of individual samples and the average color of that pixel. Um, it tells us, when it's a large value, it tells us that the samples in that pixel are noisy. If it's a small value, or if it's a zero in the case where all the samples have the same value, so we have some solid background or something, um, then the variance is low. Um, why, is it, why is it useful to know the variance in a pixel? Because it's directly related to the uh, Monte Carlo error for that pixel. If we have a large variance, then the error is large. If we have a small variance, the error is smaller. Um, we can ask our renderer to compute the variance for all the pixels. Um, and there's a small uh, hurdle here because we need to, uh, we don't know what the average color of the pixel is until we take all the samples. And if we store all the samples, that's gonna be a lot of memory because we may have thousands of samples per pixel. But there are incremental algorithms for computing variance, so uh, it took me a while to actually find them because I slept through my statistics course at university. Um, but there's a way to do that. Uh, so we can compute the variance, but we can't really directly use it for our denoiser. Why? Because it's constant for a given pixel. It doesn't really tell us how noisy the final image is. Um, that's why instead of the variance itself, we use something that's called noise level. Um, and it tells us uh, how much apparent noise is there in the image. And the renderer takes into account a bunch of things to compute this noise level. Uh, what it looks like for this image, for example, the noise level uh, would look something like this. You get uh, larger values where there is more noise. If you go back to the previous image, you probably notice some noise here and some noise in the shadows. And uh, the uh, noise level render element is larger in those areas. So these are the areas where we want our denoiser to put more work. Uh, it's also, incidentally, that the same value that we use in our adaptive image sampler in V-Ray. So we already compute it anyway, we just need to store it in a separate render element. It didn't really cost us anything to compute this additional information. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is the, when we have depth of field or motion blur, the field feature elements like the normals or the diffuse um, texture color are actually noisy, and maybe it's not very apparent on the projector, but uh, these areas here have little noise because of the depth of field. And if we use those elements directly, we get some noise in the final result which again, unfortunately here you can't really <laughs> see it, but if you look at the slides when we publish them, you'll be able to see that. Um, and there is no real way for the denoiser to find out uh, which parts of the image are in focus and which are not. That's why we asked our renderer to produce another render element called a defocus amount render element, which tells us which parts of the image are in focus and which parts are not. So the denoiser knows that when this render element is large, for example here, we have something that's not really in focus and we can actually blur it more. Uh, there's also something that uh, I call a 3D weight. It's a concept that I took from the radiance map of V-Ray and it tells the radiance map algorithm when it can blend between different samples in 3D space. Uh, for example, if we have something like this, so these are the sample positions, these are the surface normals, it's okay to blend those samples. If we have such a configuration, it's okay to blend as well, but it's not okay to blend when we have such uh, configuration of the samples, because usually here we have a small shadow that we don't want to lose. Uh, we can do the same thing for the denoiser. Uh, it would require us to get two additional render elements. We would need the world positions of the uh, pixels so that, uh, and the normals so that we can perform uh, the same calculations. It's the same formula that I used for uh, Vray's radiance map. 
Uh, okay, some results. This is a noisy image, obviously. Uh, this is the original one. Uh, this is the result computed with just bilateral filter based on the colors and the normals and the diffuse texture color. Uh, it's a nice image, it preserves detail quite well. Uh, but if you look a little carefully, you will notice that it blurs this edge a little bit more than it should. Uh, why? Because the points on this side and on this side have exactly the same normal. They, the colors are not very different, just different shades of gray, so um, it tends to be a little bit blurrier than it should be. Uh, if we take this 3D white into account, uh, I don't know if we can notice, there's a little bit of change in this edge here. Basically, if we take the 3D weight into account, it's slightly sharper because we know that we can't blend pixels from this side of the edge with pixels on the other side of the edge. Uh, and this is just a comparison with the original image. So, so far so good. Uh, I got here at some point and bilateral filtering generally seemed to work fairly well. Uh, but there were still some annoying things, like if you look at the wall here, it's a little splotchy, and it's not really an image that you would like to show to a client uh, if you do architectural visualizations. So the question was, when I got to this point, can we make it better? Um, and yeah, the bilateral fil filter is uh, okay, but it's not the best thing that we can probably do. Um, yes, we can do better. There's another filtering method called non-local means uh, filtering. It was introduced in 2005 by a guy called Anthony Boadis. Um, and he realized that instead of comparing the color of pixels to determine whether we can blend them, we can actually compare small blocks of pixels. Um, I tried different block sizes. Uh, I ended up using five by five blocks. The, the original algorithm that uh, Bart has described compares blocks from anywhere in the image. Like you can take a sample that's a uh, block that's from this side and you compare it to a block that's here and if they are similar enough, you will blend them. Um, I didn't do that uh, for performance reasons, so I still restricted the search for similar blocks just within the small region around each pixel. Uh, and we can do this not only for colors, we can do this uh, for normals, diffuse uh, texture, color, and so on. Um, I did it only for the color and the normals. I didn't, uh, I just used the regular pixel comparison for all the other feature elements because it just seemed to work uh, better. And the formula, the final result for this filter is still a weighted average. Uh, it's still the same formula that we had in the beginning. Uh, but we no longer have the distance between the pixels, P and Q. We just have the difference in the uh, uh, colors in a block around each pixel. This is the difference of the normals in a block around each, each pixel, and then the differences in the diffuse texture, color, and so on. Uh, the block differences are computed basically, uh, and here I have a slide that explains in a little more detail. These are the pixels that we are comparing. So we're basically going through uh, a five by, five by five block around each pixel and we're subtracting the corresponding uh, color value. So we take this color, subtract it from this one, square the difference. We do the same for this and this and so on. And the sign here is multiplication because we take the uh, average of all that. And the whole idea why we do this, because we are able to better detect similar features in the image. So if we have an edge that goes like this through the two blocks, um, if we compare just the center pixel values like we did with the bilateral filtering, uh, the colors are the same, but the non-local means filter looks at the whole block. And in this case, because the edges are very similar, we get a small difference, uh, a small color difference for the pixels for uh, P and Q. But if the edges are like this, even though the center pixels are still the same color, we get a large difference uh, between those blocks because uh, when we take the difference between the uh, pixels within the block, they're all quite large. And this is the result that we get by applying this algorithm. 
Uh, as a comparison, this is the bilateral filter, this is the non-local means. Uh, as you can see, they're all very similar, but uh, all the splotches are gone, and this image generally looks a lot smoother. Uh, and it's something that yeah, you can actually show to your clients, or our clients. You can show to their clients, actually. Um, here I experimented with different sizes of the block, of the blocks uh, here, I just use one pixel blocks, so just comparing pixel values. Uh, this is nine pixel blocks, three by three around each pixel. The only differences you can probably see are here where you have a little bit of detail and maybe the uh, grids here on the ceiling. It's not a big difference, so again, it takes a while to notice it. Uh, just the uh, nine pixel blocks make this area slightly sharper. And there's also, uh, yeah. So I did this and it turned out to be very good actually. Um, it had all the good qualities of the bilateral filtering, uh, but it was also smoother and uh, it preserved the edges a lot better. And that's more or less the final algorithm that we used with a few final touches. Um, what are those? First, I didn't actually use weighted averages. Uh, until now, I uh, said that we are doing weighted averages, but that's not what we ended up doing eventually. We used the least squares fit to uh, find the uh, pixel colors. It's the same approach that we used in the radiance caching algorithm of V-Ray, and it worked better in that case. It works better for image noising as well. Um, also, when I compare the blocks of colors, I don't actually compare the center pixels. Um, why? Because it helped to reduce fireflies a little bit. Uh, firefly is just a very bright speckle in the image that's different, very different from the surroundings, and I have an example a little further on. Um, we also do all, the, all this blurring and all the calculations are done in sRGB color space. Um, the logic behind this was because people are generally more sensitive to dark colors, and if you don't do that, you end up blurring a lot of shadow detail. Um, other things that we implemented is uh, denoising of individual render elements. Um, what I showed so far was only denoising of the final RGB image, but nothing prevents us to do the same thing that uh, Jensen did so many years ago, to split the image into separate components, diffuse lighting, uh, direct lighting, global illumination, reflection, and so on, denoise all those elements completely separately from each other, and then add them back together to get the final result. And this works. Uh, it tends to pre preserve details like textures a lot better, but it has some drawbacks, because the individual elements can be way noisier than the RGB, and they might be difficult to denoise properly. Uh, this is just an example of why I do not take the center pixel into account when comparing blocks. Uh, this is an error motion image which has some sort of fireflies here. Uh, this is a standard non-local means filtering and this is without comparing the center pixels in the blocks and it's just slightly better. Uh, if I zoom in this image it just looks slightly better than uh, standard non-local means. Other things that we did also, uh, we can compare pixel blocks not just from the same image, but we can compare pixel blocks from several frames of an animation. Um, this helps us to reduce noise for uh, animated images. Uh, so we extend the least squares algorithm to work uh, also in the time dimension. Um, and it's no, useful not only to reduce noise, but also just if you have, uh, because of anti-aliasing sampling, well, it's still kind of noise, but sometimes you get shimmering when you have fine details like fur or hair, and this approach helps to uh, stabilize that type of noise. And I have an example about this, if I can find it. Okay, so there is an animation that I rendered. Um, you can see that it's 
there is a little bit of flickering going on, it's a little bit noisy. Um, and if I had a mouse, I could probably zoom in to show you what it looks like. Um, this is the result when we get when we denoise every single frame one by one. Um, it's slightly better, but there's still flickering and uh, it doesn't look quite as good as it should. Um, and the final layer that I have here is uh, using cross-frame denoising when I compare blocks from different pixels, uh, blocks from different frames. In this case, one frame behind and one frame uh, before and one frame after the current one. Uh, and it generally tends to work better. I don't know if you can actually see any difference. This projector is a denoiser in itself. Okay. Um, you can look at these later on on the laptop. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, so that's what ended up in V-Ray this spring. Um, things that I want to try, but I didn't get uh, time to do them, is to research some way to better handle depth of field and motion blur. Because currently, um, I use the defocus amount filter uh, render element, but it sometimes tends to blur things too much. I want to deal with fireflies better, um, and I also want to experiment with a dual filtering algorithm, uh, which is actually, it's a very clever approach to get better results. Basically, you just render two images with different random seeds. So they're both noisy. Um, and all the weights for the filtering are calculated based on one image, but the final colors are uh, taken from the other image. Uh, then you swap them. You do the same uh, again with the swapped images, and you blend the results. And this actually works pretty good. There's a, the Alta Stenoiser that I mentioned before uses this approach and the results are good. Also, uh, it helps with fireflies. Um, and uh, generally works better. Unfortunately, it requires to render the same image twice. There are ways to get around that, like you can split the image samples in the render itself and you can compute both images at once or you can just render uh, two versions of the image side by side. And Altus can actually take such an image uh, and produce and combine those side by side images into one. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I want to do in the future. And now a few words about uh, how I actually developed this algorithm. Um, because it's supposed to be educational. Uh, and some of my colleagues asked me how I came up with all this. Well, it didn't happen just by sitting at the keyboard and typing everything from beginning to end. Uh, there was a lot of preparation work involved. Um, I try to find and read all the papers on the subject that I could find. Um, and it's not just reading those papers, you have to read them many times because they are difficult to understand. Uh, sometimes the authors assume that you have some previous knowledge. I didn't have any previous knowledge on denoising, so I had to uh, go and read a lot of other reference papers, uh, papers that were referenced in the ones that I read. Sometimes the authors skip details that they think are obvious or unimportant, but actually are not obvious to me. So it took a lot of reading. Uh, that's, that's my point. Um, also, I wanted to get some test cases for uh, my denoising algorithm. I didn't have any denoising algorithm yet, but I had an idea of what kind of images our users produce and what they would expect from such an algorithm. So I tried to collect as many scenes that I could find with uh, lots of details, different materials. Some of them were still images, some of them were animations. Some had motion blur and depth of field and all that. Anything that I could think of that was going to be a problem for the denoiser, I tried to find a sample, an example for it. And these example images were very helpful later on when we did a GPU version of the denoiser. 
uh, because we could just run the GPU version, and if it produced the same results as the CPU one on these tests, then we could assume that it works correctly. Um, also, I mentioned that I slept through my university course in statistics, so I had to go back and read what I slept through. Um, papers, these are the papers that I've read and which I actually found most useful. Um, some of them, like I didn't use the ideas from all papers, they're just, some of them are just useful because uh, they give you a background of the whole area. Um, these are some of the example images that I collected and that I tested my denoiser on. While developing it, some of them are uh, models from Evermotion, others are uh, scenes that I could find on the internet. Uh, other scenes are done by our 3D guys, like this one here. Um, there's a teapot, obviously, motion blurred. Um, and I even bought a model of a cat from TurboSquid to test how the algorithm performs with fur. So it looks like a dog, but it's actually a cat. Um, so I also wanted to, uh, it, was, it would have been too slow to develop this denoiser as a part of V-Ray, especially V-Ray for 3ds Max, because 3ds Max starts for about a minute just if you want to test things, and I couldn't do that for every single uh, line of code. So instead I did a small application to use for uh, testing purposes. It was based only on our utility libraries because I needed ways to read and write images and display something on the screen. Uh, but it actually didn't contain any very code. It was command line, so I could run all the tests and compare the results. Um, and it was very useful because later on we took this code to a separate library that we could integrate in many uh, other ways as a standalone tool uh, in V-Ray, but we also did a new plugin that uses this denoising library. Um, and also it made the development of the GPU version later on uh, a lot easier. Um, I started basically by going through the papers and finding the simplest algorithms and implementing them and seeing how they work. Um, algorithms that I also tested, but eventually we didn't use them. Uh, one interesting algorithm was called multi-resolution bilateral filtering. And it was interesting because it used uh, wavelet decomposition of the image, which was a good idea to look into the whole wavelet thing and see how wavelets actually work. So it was more just I was interested to see uh, what those wavelets are, rather than uh, we didn't use it for denoising eventually because it had problems, uh, artifacts, and so on. But it was a useful experience. Uh, there also there is also an algorithm called ray histogram fusion. Uh, which is very elegant, and I implemented it to see what it would look like. Uh, it, was, it handles depth of field and motion blur very naturally. Uh, it doesn't need any feature elements. It doesn't need information about normals or world positions or anything. Um, but unfortunately, when I compared it to our final result, it was actually worse because it was blurring the image a little bit more than I would have liked. Uh, it had a lot of large memory requirements, um, and so on. Um, but basically, just the idea of the uh, ray histogram fusion is to make a histogram of the samples in each pixel. And then instead of comparing colors of pixels, it just compares histograms. And the idea is that pixels that have similar histograms uh, can be safely blended because they probably re represent the same thing in the, in the scene. Uh, also, it turned out to be patented. Um, how did I find out? When doing this type of research and when reading papers specifically, it's a good idea to keep in mind that anything in those papers can be patented. Um, there are, even when you read SIGGRAPH papers, especially if they come from uh, companies that are in some sort competitors, uh, you could expect that many of those papers could be patented. And the problem is that you don't actually know this until several years after that when the patent is uh, finally approved. So just going and implementing the latest SIGGRAPH paper is actually a very bad idea. Uh, especially for, and this has happened a number of times with companies like uh, SolidAngle, Eon, 
Disney, Pixar, Autodesk, NVIDIA. If you read papers from them, you should know that they're probably patented and you should maybe look into that before rushing off to implement them. Um, how do they look for patents? One way is to look for the names of the authors. The other way is to look for the companies where the authors work. Uh, just to make sure you're not accidentally infringing on a pattern without knowing it. And like I said, implementing the latest papers is probably a bad idea. That's why I generally try to stick to known algorithms that are, have been around for a while and I just made them work for my specific case. Uh, in this case, uh, when I did this, the array histogram fusion turned out to be patented. So uh, good that we didn't use it. There was a lot of trial and error developing this tool. The tests helped a lot because every time I made a change, I could run the denoise around all the different images and look at the results. And um, yesterday we had a couple of talks about test-driven development. And this is kind of like that, only not exactly because I couldn't write uh, tests for my code because I didn't know what the code would be like. Um, and there's no way to make uh, test for whether an image is a good image or a bad image, so I just had to uh, judge this by eye. And some of the changes that I did make, made some of the tests look better, but made others look worse, so there was a lot of tinkering with getting the right formulas and the right multiplications in the right places and so on. Um, of course, eventually when you have the final algorithm and you decide that this is it and this is what is going into the actual product, you can uh, go ahead and write unit tests for your code, now that you know what the code is actually supposed to be doing. Uh, and this actually helped, like I said, with the GPU development. Uh, the denoiser, uh, we integrated in all the different versions of Yuri for 3ds Max, Maya, and Modo. Uh, the standalone tool is still there. Uh, people can use it for animations. And we also did a new plugin which can be uh, it doesn't depend on V-Ray. Uh, it's a free tool that uh, you can load and you can use it to denoise renders. We needed to do this because uh, with all these denoising approaches, it's not very clear what to do when you have a composite where you take different render elements, you do stuff to them like color corrections, uh, and then you combine them together. Um, it turned out that having a denoiser at the end of the whole compositing process just simplifies the whole thing. I mentioned the GPU a number of times. Our GPU team took the code uh, and rewrote it in OpenCL. It's basically just image processing code and GPUs are really, really good at this. So the result is many times faster than uh, the CPU. That's it. All right, questions? Uh, thank you, Vlado, it was a very nice talk. I have a question, have you tried to include the pixel variance as a feature into the distance function and see what happens? Uh, why would I do that? Because it's a measure of similarity of the pixels. If they have close variance, maybe they come from the same well, the, the, yeah, no, I didn't do that. Um, like I said, we, I might be a good idea, so I could try that. I just use the noise level, and because of V-Ray tries to minimize the noise level and to equalize it everywhere in the image, usually the noise level at render element turns out to be uniformly gray everywhere. So that one wouldn't have worked, but you're right that maybe the variance would have been a, a good fit for that. So we can try. Uh, hello, I hope the noise variance is not really the 3D weight uh, being the difference in, I guess, the normals. But uh, did you use this into the per patch technique? Uh, likewise, in the per pixel technique that you showed earlier? Uh, 
Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, did, you new, did you use 3D weight into the final, uh, uh, final filter? Yes. Uh, then, uh, okay, that was a, a quick one. How do you actually uh, uh, patent an algorithm? Um, you hire some lawyers and you say I want to patent something and they take your money and they do it. <laughs> um, it it's a long process. We went through this with our material scanner um, and it takes a while to explain and to write exactly what your invention is and then they try to find out if there's something similar already in existence and they usually find all kinds of irrelevant stuff and you have to convince them that no, your approach is different than theirs. And a few years down the road, if everything goes well, and a few thousand dollars later, you will have a patent. I would like to ask, um, why you, uh, do you have some level of denoising that can be introduced? Because, for example, Bulgarian filmmakers will be very unhappy without noising because they say noising is the art, noise uh, imitate the grain of the uh, film, so no noise, no art. Um, what they usually end up doing is that they want their renders coming out of the render engine to be very clean and then they add additional noise in something like Nuke. So they, they say that the, the noise you get from Monte Carlo integration is slightly different from film noise um, and they don't like to use it directly. So they want the renders to be clean. Even if they will make them noisy after. So. Hey, Volo. Uh, so, so specifically for the case of uh, denoising depth of field images and uh, motion blur images, uh, I'm thinking, uh, so in these cases, you actually end up having multiple rays sampled for uh, each point in the scene. Yes. And uh, after you, after you project these ray, rays into your simulated camera, they, they end up on some sort of a film, I presume, mm -hmm. where you effectively have a light field. Uh, could you consider defining a, a filter for the light field itself and maybe, so, so the, the idea would be, if, if you store information about uh, where each ray came from, specifically the, the direct point that it hit as soon as it, it shot out of the camera, then you could potentially do some denoising across the rays that you've captured from this point. Uh, but these would be rays that you've captured in neighboring pixels, but coming from a single point in the yes, scene. Yes, it can be done, but I didn't do it. Okay, so is, yeah, it, it's just an idea. It's, uh, there's, a, there's actually an interesting way to improve the results for depth of field. Uh, so instead of just tracing rays to a pixel randomly and until they hit something, you can do something that's a little bit like reverse bidirectional path tracing. So once you hit the point from any pixel, you try to reproject it back to the screen on other pixels. Uh, and this helps, uh, actually, it's been done, it works very well. Uh, I think Weta Digital is developing their own renderer called Manuka that does this sort of thing for depth of field and it works fairly well. So um, effectively, there's splatting a subsection yes. of the BRDF onto yes. the film. Yeah. Okay. And it works. Yeah. Okay. But it's not directly related to denoising, it's just a way of decreasing the noise in the image, but it's not denoising it as such. Hey, Blado. Hi. Um, a lot of this you presented, it actually kind of seems to me it borders on machine learning, you know. Yes, uh, there, <laughs> there, are, there are experiments with that. Uh, I think Microsoft had some papers on, they basically took a neural network and they taught it to distinguish noise from features so that it can compute a good image. So yeah, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, do we have any experiments with that or is it patented already? Uh, it's probably, I don't know about patented. It's like, if it's a simple idea and it gives great results, you can be pretty certain that somebody patented it somewhere. Uh, but there's a lot of research in that direction right now. Uh, I didn't try it because I myself have never done anything with neural networks. I want to, I just don't have the time. Thank you. Uh, 
so a lot of these uh, techniques uh, seem that uh, they work well offline. Can we uh, can they be used also uh, reducing the number of samples that um, VRA produces while rendering? Um, the actual algorithm still takes a little bit of time. Like even on a GPU, it might take several seconds for a large units, so it's not practical to do it all the time. But what we ended up doing with the progressive sampler of VRA, we would recompute a denoised result like every 30 seconds or every minute or something like that. So the user always has a denoised version of the image. Uh, it's just a little bit older than the current render. And it works fairly well. If you run, if you use the denoiser with V-Ray and you set V-Ray to use the progressive sampler, you will see the denoising element getting updated with the render. Okay, then uh, can that information be used to stop the rendering? Um, it could technically. We had users that wanted to be able to just tell V-Ray to stop when the denoised element looks good enough. Um, we just haven't done it yet. Okay, thank you. You mentioned that you're planning to uh, render basically two images, use the two versions of the rendered image to denoise. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't this beating the purpose? I mean, you have to like render twice uh, and then um, do some denoising, uh, yes. uh, then just invest more time in the initial render. Um, the point is that those two images are lower quality images than what you would do originally. So the render time is still the same. There are two renders, but they're worse quality, so they go faster. Uh, so the idea is that for the same render time, you would get the, you won't actually increase your render times. Other questions? I just had one more idea that, that I want to share. Uh, there, there's a whole field called natural image statistics, and it's something that one could potentially look into. From what I understand is that uh, these are statistical measures that uh, allow you to distinguish a natural image from, let's say, something that would be noise. Um, maybe some of the work that's, uh, that's done there could be applied to Okay. To, to, for, for you to, to distinguish uh, a, a noisy and not so... Yep. Yeah, like I said, I, I didn't know anything about the noising at all when I started, so it's very possible that I missed a lot of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's a cool idea. Well, if no more questions, then thank you very much. And